Good morning, church family. It is so good to be here at Beltline this morning. I regret the circumstance, uh, but I'm glad that Steve's getting himself fixed up and getting back to 100%. And I don't know, he, he'll probably tell you this, but uh, when a preacher hasn't been able to preach in a while, you just wait until he gets back up here. It's going to be a house on fire, I can promise you that. I'm thankful to be here. I love what you've done with the room. Looks great. I know more things are planned, and that's exciting. I'm excited that my family is here with me today. My wife, Marla, my son, Preston, my mom and dad, my sister, Gretchen, her husband, Chris. Uh, they're all here, and the reason they're in town is because yesterday evening we had a big night. My daughter, Kayla, got married, and so we added a son-in-law last night. And so if there's a faraway look in any of our eyes today, uh, we're kind of in recovery mode from that. And so uh, we're excited, though, about what the future is for them. And uh, just thankful for all of that. If you've got your Bible, you may want to open it to Luke chapter 24. That'll be the text that we're going to be in this morning as we study. We have video everywhere today, and it's not always to our advantage. But I wonder what it would have been like if you think about that tomb. That tomb is silent. Obviously, it's going to be dark inside because it's been sealed off. It's being guarded to prevent tampering. And most of all, that body that's in the tomb, it's, it's been wrapped. It's motionless. It's lifeless. But then something happens, and I don't know if that lifeless body of Jesus, I don't know if it began to, to gradually warm up as life re-entered it. I don't know that it, or was it you know, instantaneous and, and suddenly it's alive and he's gone. I don't know how it happened. I wonder in that moment if God the Son, in, in the thought of having to re-enter that body, even though it's not going to be very long, I, I wonder if there may have been just that bit of, man, I can't believe I've got to go back among the people. But see, the thing is, Jesus is alive. He's, he's won the victory over death. God's plan to deal with our sin problem through Jesus coming to the earth, through living here, through living among us, through giving his life and being raised. God's plan has been carried out. And so now there is this, there is this amazing good news message that needs to be told. I mean, if somebody lives among us, and this person lives among us, and they tell us that he's going to die, but that he's going to rise again. If you see all that happen, that's the guy you'd better put your faith in. That's the guy you'd better be following. And that's what's going on with Jesus. But see, the problem is, even among those who should understand it best, not everyone is going to be quick to believe, much less quick to understand. And so on the first day of the week, We've got an empty tomb, but we are about to have some very confused people. Some people who actually the scripture is going to tell us they're going to refuse to believe that Jesus has been raised. Now, you've got some women. They've come out of Galilee. You've got Mary Magdalene. You've got Mary, the mother of James. You've got Salome. You've got Joanna, potentially some others. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 55, the Bible tells us that these ladies, they have watched this body be placed in the tomb. And that's powerful because they have witnessed the fact, yes, Jesus was dead. Yes, we saw him being placed in that tomb. And so after the burial, they have prepared spices. They've rested on the Sabbath according to the law. And now on the first day of the week, they're, arrived, they're arriving at the tomb. They're expecting to anoint the body. And, and is that an emotional time? Well, obviously but it's also not uncommon for what you would do in that time. What they're doing was, was very much normal. But their arrival is marked by them, according to Scripture, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 4. They are perplexed because they look into the tomb, they arrive, the door's open, the, the stone's been rolled away, and there is no body, and they are perplexed. And then in verse 5, the Bible says they're terrified. And the reason they're terrified is there are these two angels of the Lord in this dazzling clothing. And so these two men tell them that Jesus is risen. And as these angels of the Lord rehearse in their hearing what had been said by Jesus in the past, suddenly it, the, the Bible says they begin to remember some of the things that Jesus has said. 
And so they do the next thing that you would do. Who are you going to go talk to if you've gotten this great news? Well, you're going to go talk to the 11. You're going to go talk to the inner circle. You're going to go talk to the guys who are on staff, in essence, with Jesus. You want to talk to those guys and let them know what you now know. And so you would expect that the, when you get back to the 11 and you report what you know, there's going to be excitement, there's going to be joy, there's going to be elation. This is exactly what Jesus has said is going to happen. But notice verse 11 of that text. The Bible says, These words, the words the women are speaking, appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. That's a sad morning. When the people who should have understood it best, the people who'd been around the message the most, the people, if if they're not going to get it, nobody's going to get it. And those guys are saying, you're out of your mind. There's no way. The Bible says that Peter actually goes to the tomb. He runs over there. He wants to see it for himself. And when he sees it, he, he, he he, he goes home. He just goes home. And so over the next 40 days, Jesus is going to begin appearing to people. But they're not always going to immediately know it's him. And they're not always going to immediately be ready to buy into the message. And so that's the scenario we have here in Luke chapter 24. Two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And Cleopas is named in the text. And someone who's unnamed in the text is with Cleopas. And they're discussing things. They're discussing the crucifixion of Jesus. It's just like we do. We turn on the news and there's something horrific or amazing or or unexplainable. When there's something going on in our world, when we get together, we talk about it. And that's what they're doing on this day. And so Jesus joins up with them, but they don't know it's him. And he asks them what they're talking about. And and they cannot believe that that he would not know. How can you not know what's going on? I mean, it's the only thing people are talking about. Jesus crucified. That's the hashtag that's trending right now. The not recognizing Jesus thing. Likely a supernatural thing. Mark chapter 16 verse 12 uh, tells us that the the way it's worded in that text, it says that, that, that he appeared in a different form. Now, I've talked to some people who believe that um, maybe his clothing had disguised him in some way. I've talked to some people who believe that Jesus is just so out of context for them at this point that he's the last person they're expecting to see, and so they do not recognize him. I don't really agree with that. But he's not recognized. And God, in his wisdom and in his way, is preventing these two disciples from recognizing Jesus. You know, maybe that... Had, had, had they recognized Jesus, they wouldn't have been real with him in the moment. Or maybe it's one of those where they would have been so excited that they wouldn't have taken time to listen to the life-changing message that Jesus is going to share with them. God knows why. We don't have to. But what a powerful, life-changing encounter we're about to see in Luke chapter 24. I, I want to read for you from the scripture in chapter 24. I want to begin in verse 17. Jesus has shown up. Well, we'll start in 13. Behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you're walking? And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And he said to them, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they'd also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said. But him we did not see. Do you notice the problem with these two disciples on this road? Long about verse 21, 
Instead of just taking in and having listened to the message from Jesus along the way and comparing what Jesus predicted with the facts in front of them, in verse 21, they're sad because it says, we were hoping. You know, we had an idea in our minds about what needed to happen here. And the ideas that they had about Jesus liberating, Jesus bringing a kingdom to the earth... Their ideas were preventing them from hearing Jesus' real message. You know, the experience of the empty tomb, it should have resulted in, hey, praise God, it's just like Jesus told us it would be. But instead, it's we don't understand. Or we're not going to believe you, you must be out of your mind. And so Jesus' response to them is where I want to take the big idea, the big thought for this morning, the thing that I'd like you to walk out of here with today. Notice verse 25 of the text and notice the next three verses. The Bible says, And he said to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. He calls these followers, he calls these disciples, he calls them foolish men. He calls them slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Not that the information about Jesus hadn't been available. Not that they did not know or had not heard about it. They simply had not chosen to internalize it. They had not chosen to believe it. Other hopes, he's going to free Israel, had gotten in the way. You might say it this way, they had a lower story, an earthly agenda, and their agenda that was, it was competing against God's upper story, God's heavenly plan. And so the Bible ends up saying that Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, explain to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now that could take a while, right? Here's the thing. Today, in 2016, I wonder if there's anything that Jesus might decide that he would need to re-explain about himself today, not to the world, but to us, to the people who are already following, to Christians. I mean, keep in mind, these two guys, they're disciples. They're not Pharisee critics. They're not Roman soldiers. These are the people who wanted Jesus to do something amazing for them that they didn't think that they could do for themselves. They wanted liberation. And yet it's because of their slowness of heart to believe that Jesus is having to retell his story from Scripture, Scripture that they had access to. Can you see why the what might Jesus need to re-explain today is actually a pretty good question? I mean, would Jesus ever be able to, to make a similar assessment of us as if he were to come and spend a little over a month with us here, say, indicator in this congregation, would he, would he ever decide, well, hey, walk up on a conversation between a couple of us and say, well, you know, here's some things you really need to understand about me. Or, or maybe you as a husband and wife, or are there some things that Jesus might walk up and say, well, you're, you're doing this marriage thing, but here are some things that you really need to understand about me. Or maybe Jesus walks up and you're in a conversation with a, a brother or sister here in the congregation, but this is somebody that you've been at odds with, you've had your differences with, and you understand uh, tra traumatic circumstances have a way of uniting people, even those who've been at odds. And so maybe that person that you've been at odds with, maybe Jesus is going to come up and he's going to have to explain some things again about himself. Another way to ask it, in what areas is it possible that my life might look like I'm resisting Jesus in some way? These aren't exhaustive and, and we could do a series on all of them. This is high-level stuff, but I want to give you three thoughts this morning. What might Jesus need to better under, us to better understand about discipleship? I'm excited to hear about what you've been involved in in this summer. I mean, that's, that's what it's about, getting out into the world and being the hands and the feet of Jesus and, and helping make disciples, following him. But, but would Jesus ever need to re-explain? Luke chapter 6, verse 40 says, A pupil, a disciple, 
is not above his teacher, but everyone after he's been fully trained will be like his teacher. You know, instead of attempting to be like the teacher, do we ever treat Jesus like he ought to just be happy to have us on the team in some capacity? Or I think of Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Uh, Jesus says, hey, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Are there people in my life who hold a, prior, a higher priority in my life than Jesus himself? Or Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We don't see people carrying physical crosses around today. But in Jesus' day, you might see that from time to time. And if you saw that in his day, there was something you immediately knew. Uh, the person bearing a cross in that day, that was a dead man walking. That's what it was. And the idea is, have we died to self enough so that we can live for him? And then finally, Luke 14, verse 33, So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Does any of my stuff, do the, do the things that God have blessed me with, do any of those things hold a higher priority in my life than my life, than, than Jesus? And so might he need to re-explain discipleship? Second, might he re need to reteach his plea about unity? The idea that we be on the same page united in him. The words in scripture are familiar to you. John chapter 17 verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone but for those also who believe in me through their word that they may all be one even as you father are in me and I in you that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Here's the question. Do I obsess constantly over the areas where I differ from my brothers and sisters in Christ? Do I make myself feel good as I differ with them by telling myself that I'm standing for truth? Or do we unite over the crisis in our world that is people who still need to know Jesus? I'm thankful that we're going to be praying about our nation tonight. Because the crisis is now more evident than ever. There are a lot of people who need to know Jesus. Jesus really ought to become politically correct in our land again. And we've lost that. And we're paying the price for that. It begins in the home. Are we united about the crisis that is the need to evangelize? Because every one of us, we ought to be trying to grow. And, and we'll never be all at the same point in the journey. And, and so we're going to have our differences. But the lost world is also always going to be the thing that we can unite around. Number three. What might Jesus decide that he would re, need to re-explain about love? Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 27. And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to them, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. Could someone, even though I'm a Christian, even though I'm a, I'm a disciple, and, but could someone look at my life? There was a discussion in class this morning. It's easy in here between 9 and 11 on Sunday and we get that. But, but what happens tomorrow at 9.30 when everything at the office has gone wrong? Or, or Tuesday afternoon when we're trying to get through the work day and, and everybody's trying to make a mess of everything we're trying to accomplish? Can people during the week look at my life and learn a lesson about love? Love for God? Love for enemies? Love for the irritants in my life? Love for family members? Love for other Christians. Love for those who need Jesus. You can sum it up by simply asking, am I selfless enough to live the life that the empty tomb calls me to live? There in Luke 24 at supper as the eyes of Cleopas and that other disciple are opened. And they realize they've been with Jesus. I want to leave you by... Uh, thinking about these last verses. Verse 28 says, uh, They approached the village where they were going, and he uh, acted as though he was going to continue farther. 
But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And then the very next thing they say is this. Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scripture to us? See, for these two disciples, the truth about Jesus, the truth being explained when their hearts were open, when their hearts were soft, the truth about Jesus had ignited ignited a fire within them even before they knew it was Jesus teaching the lesson. And so each week as we celebrate the empty tomb, See, our celebration should result in self-examination. And self-examination should result in a fire being rekindled within us every first day of the week. A fire of gratitude for Jesus and his sacrifice and the relationship with God that he makes possible through that. A relationship where we find grace and we find mercy. One where God loves us through our imperfections. It should result in a fire of determination to be better, to not allow that empty tomb to be wasted time as it relates to my life. Finally, if Jesus were going to join us for a little over a month today and walk among us, might he need to re-explain to us how great heaven is going to be? Because in the moment of living life, in the moments when things are going wrong, in the moments when people are just messing everything up for us, isn't it that sometimes heaven just kind of gets out of focus? Heaven's not in our minds. It's not what we're thinking about. See, Jesus might want us to be remembering how wonderful heaven's going to be. John 14, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. My question for you as we get ready to close today, as we get ready to sing, I stand in awe of you because we are in awe of him for all that he's done. Are you planning to join him there forever? And if you are planning to join him there forever, are you living that life that the empty tomb calls you to live? Is your life a reflection of the fact that, yes, my life has been changed by the teachings of Jesus. He's redirected the way I talk and the way I walk and the way I live. And my level of disciples, he's redirected everything. And if you ask yourself those questions today and you don't like the answers that you're receiving, be thankful that you're among family. Be thankful you're among people today that love you and that want nothing more from you than for you to be right with God. And so if there's a change you need to make in your life, this church family is ready to pray with you and for you. Maybe you're here today and you've not been baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins. Maybe you need to begin your walk with Him today. If you need to respond in any way, let it be known while we stand and while we sing.